Pew Charitable Trust's Philadelphia Research Policy Initiative. The initiative seeks to inform discussion on important issues facing the city of Baltimore, independent research. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Temple University and a master's in city and regional planning. Go planners from uh, Rutgers University. Garrett, thanks so much for coming down from Philadelphia. We are so excited to learn more about tangled titles. And if you don't know what that is, um, you will be uh, after this talk. Thanks so much, Garrett, for being here. First uh, in-person presentation in, in years, so it might be a little <laughs> rusty. There's a lot of, like, there's a lot of <laughs> yeah, but um, so yeah, thanks, Seema. Thanks for uh, for having me. Uh, happy to be here with you all. Um, yeah, she said I'm from the uh, Pew Charitable Trust Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative. Can I do the audio check? Oh. Um, Logan, right here. Are you on the Zoom call? Yeah. Okay. We're good. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, and uh, as uh, Seema said, uh, the Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative uh, seeks to inform uh, uh, the conversation in Philadelphia with a nonpartisan independent research on important issues uh, facing the city. And Philadelphia is Pew's hometown, even though um, most of Pew is uh, now in DC, we're still in Philly. Um, so yeah, talking about tangled titles and the obvious question of, of, of what is a tangled title? And put simply, it's when the deed on a home bears the name of somebody other than the apparent owner. Uh, at the heart of this is kind of a semantic thing, but a legal distinction that the terms title and deed uh, are not interchangeably really, even though they're often used that way. Uh, title is a legal right to ownership, whereas the deed is a physical document that serves as proof. Um, so tangled titles, when those things are out of sync, uh, the person living in the house, assuming the duties of home ownership, isn't on the deed. Um, in the most common form of this, the uh, record owner, owner of record, the person named on the deed is deceased. And it's one of the heirs of the deceased living in the property. So accordingly, heirs property is the more commonly used term to uh, describe the situation outside of Philadelphia. But uh, in Philly, everyone says tangled title. So um, somebody with the tangled title has a legal claim to the property, but no deed to prove it. And that shuts them out of a lot of resources that are available otherwise to homeowners. Um, and they might not realize there's a problem until they're in some kind of crisis. They need to demonstrate ownership and they find out that they can't. And as uh, one Philadelphia official put it, the tangled title will sit there and it never goes away. You'll find out when it's a problem when you can least afford to do so. Um, so the remedy in most cases where, where it is the result of the death is that fourth word of, of probate uh, the legal process of administering someone's estate after they die. And uh, we're talking strictly legal terms. And I'm in the law school building that probate, the word only applies when there's a will and estate administration is used when there's not, but a uh, will and no will. And the will is very helpful. You still have to go through the process. So our involvement with this issue came out of some previous work we had done on uh, housing affordability and poverty issues and tangled title is one of the issues that uh, came up as a, you know, a barrier to keeping people in their homes. Um, uh, so we put out this report last August, how tangled titles affect Philadelphia, um, which had a data analysis component, uh, estimating the extent of tangled titles and tying that to the demographics and geography of the city. Uh, and then a qualitative research part about uh, how this happens, what the effects are and, and how to fix it. Um, touch on that today, but mostly be focusing on the, uh, the quantitative piece of, of these two bits. Uh, but the whole report is up on our website at that uh, pithy uh, URL, or if you Google it, you should be able to find it. Um, but our top uh, findings were that uh, Philadelphia, we found at least 10,407 homes with tangled titles, and collectively they were assessed at over $1.1 billion. Um, we said at least uh, 10,000 because we were only able to identify those tangled titles that come from the death of the property owner, uh, which we think is about three quarters of all of them, um, but you know, it's still gonna miss kinds that come about through failed rent to own agreements, abandonment issues could result from deed uh, recording issues, and in some cases, property theft. But uh, in that most common scenario, the record owner dies, relative inherits the property, doesn't go through pro probate, uh, doesn't uh, record a new deed. And we found that they're all over the city, but they're more concentrated in some neighborhoods, um, generally areas with lower housing values, higher poverty, and also areas where the residents are mostly black. Um, and uh, to fix it during, uh, by probate, 
we did a little workup of like the simplest case imaginable and came up with about nine thousand uh, dollars to remedy it by a probate, which is one of the big uh, obstacles. And that's mostly attorneys' fees. And Pennsylvania has a, a inheritance tax. Um, and that's one that when we spoke to attorneys, we're like that ninth that's probably low, uh, in realistically. Um, but uh, yeah, there are resources available. Um, but quickly, why is this a problem? Uh, the short of it's kind of like you don't have an ID for your house, uh, which isn't a problem when you're paying bills. Um, but when you want something, then then it's a problem. So if you want to take out a home equity loan, if you want to get an assistance programs, uh, you can't prove you own the house. So yeah, they'll take the money, but when you need something, they said, yeah. You're not in the deed. I don't know who you are. Um, so if you're dealing with the mortgage company uh, or, or the you know, city, it's going to be tough. Um, so this is our map uh, by census tract of where they're found in the city and uh, ranges in those dark blue areas to as much as six and a half percent of houses. And then uh, the, the kind of pale yellow, less than half a percent. Um, so all over the city, but definitely some concentrations. And uh, to kind of illustrate uh, what that can look like. Um, you know, like Baltimore, Philadelphia is largely comprised of these tight uh, row home neighborhoods. So this is a kind of hypothetical neighborhood with a uh, thousand properties, roughly 60 on each block. And at 2%, uh, the citywide average, that can put about one on each block. And at 6%, that's enough to put, uh, you know, three on every block. So um, to just to kind of illustrate that even a small percentage can have a pervasive effect on a neighborhood. Uh, and back to that map. Um, so the colors are, are deciles, so 10 equally sized tracks of, uh, or equally sized groups of census tracks. And, um, you know, we, uh, so yeah, each of the colors is a decile and it corresponds to one of the rows on the, uh, on the table there. And we did that uh, to look at the, this kind of demographics associated. So they're not the characteristics of the properties themselves, but just of the areas that they're in. And uh, there's some pretty clear associations uh, with home values, household income, and, and poverty that kind of track all the way up and down. Uh, the more tangled, uh, pervasive tangled areas at the top, those dark blue areas have uh, the lowest housing uh, values, um, median household income of $28,000 per year, and a poverty rate of 34%. Uh, and that's the areas that up to 6.5% uh, of homes have tangled title. And then at the bottom, uh, those light yellow areas least impacted. Uh, median income of $75,000 uh, and a uh, poverty rate of 17%, uh, just below the average. We use the same kind of framework to look at race and ethnicity and uh, some clear correlations there as well in that most uh, impacted group of tracks, uh, you know, population of 130,000 people, 87% um, of residents in that group uh, are black and uh, only 5% white. And if you go down the chart, it kind of flips. So when you get to the bottom, the least impacted tracks are 62% white and 13% uh, black. And the, the correlations were like less clear um, for uh, other uh, racial and ethnic groups. Um, and we think, you know, this could have uh, a lot to do with different uh, levels of estate planning between groups. But there's a national study that uh, among people over 50, only 20% of black households had valid wills compared with 63% of uh, white people. And a uh, uh, will is a crucially important tool, um, both for you know, directing the process and also just in the process of making a will, you have to have the conversation with somebody uh, about this is what has to happen when I die. And I think that's a lot of uh, how this happens is kind of just an information gap. Um, uh, we note that one of the reasons this is important is that in Philadelphia, 48% uh, of black households own their uh, own homes which is the highest rate of black home ownership among the 50 largest cities in the country. Um, and the prevalence of tangled titles in those areas can threaten that high level of home ownership. Um, I did take a look, Baltimore is at, yeah, in, at number four with 42% uh, of black households owning their own homes. Um, so in short, those were our uh, quantitative findings. I'll talk a bit more about uh, how we did that. Uh, as I, uh, what order is it? This is a new slide. Um, so. Uh, yeah, to identify a tangled title of the type that comes from someone being deceased, you can need three things of identifying your universe of residential properties, uh, finding out who's on the deeds, and then the harder part, the third one, is uh, checking if those people are dead. Um, so our residential property addresses and the assessed values that uh, came that 1.1 billion number, which really helped uh, kind of promote the report, 
uh, were drawn from the city's assessment data. Uh, and then the owners uh, are in the assessment data as well, but we had kind of a data problem that uh, they weren't consistently formatted in like a first name, last name format. Um, so, I mean, a lot of this project was just data cleaning, like a lot of projects are. Um, so the, uh, there's another data set from the Department of Records that has uh, real estate transfers, the uh, deeds. And the information on the owners should be the same in both, but the uh, Department of Records was consistently formatted. So we drew the names from there uh, whenever possible. And then the uh, checking if they're deceased part, there are services, there's a, a number of them, if you Google it, um, deceased suppression service that uh, all have their own proprietary data sets built around the Social Security Administration's death master file. And uh, they kind of market these for if you're doing mass mailings to clean your mailing list of people who are you know, deceased. Um, but it's also kind of our same purpose. So we sent them a bunch of name address pairs and they sent back uh, you know, uh, flagging who is deceased. So yeah, we sent them, uh, there's 710,000 total record owners, 30,000 of them uh, ended up being deceased. Um, just some limitations quickly that uh, yeah, only one cause of tangled titles. Uh, the deceased suppression services, it's not really clear how they do what they do, uh, to use the, the black box uh, term, but um, the death master file doesn't have addresses in it, and the address is a big part of the match, so they all have some uh, vague language about and other records of proprietary methods or something. Um, not clear where they're getting that, and, and everyone has like the most comprehensive thing according to their own websites. Um, but uh, we did learn from the vendor we went with that each name is only associated with a single address. So if you moved or had multiple properties, it, it might get missed. Uh, and then of course it's a string match, which is always a little imprecise. Um, we had everyone's social security number, that would have been better, but that's not in the property records. Um, so this is what that looked like in the end. Um, we started with our 510,000 residential properties. Uh, the, Gray is things we uh, eliminated uh, from suspicion. So there's a bunch that were owned by LLCs or the city of Philadelphia or whatever, so we could knock those out. Uh, and then only those owned by natural persons are what we checked. Uh, 900, no, I know numbers, 9,000 of them. Uh, all the owners were deceased. So that was an easy tangled title. Then there was this group in the middle that was kind of problematic that uh, there was a mix of deceased and living uh, owners and whether or not that uh, property is tangled depends on the form of shared ownership. And I looked, it's the same in, uh, in Maryland, but in Pennsylvania, there's three kinds, there's three ways you can own a property with somebody else. Uh, there's joint, uh, joint tenants with the right of survivorship. Uh, there's tenancy by the entirety. And in those types, uh, everyone owns a house together. And if one person dies, the share goes to the remaining owners. Um, that's kind of the default if you're married and buying a house together. For unmarried people, uh, or if it's specified as tenants in common, um, then your share goes to your heirs. It doesn't go to the uh, other uh, person um, on the deed. So those could still be a tangled title if one of those people dies because you either have to buy out the heirs or add them to the, to the title, um, but they're going to be one of the owners. Um, so that information was not indexed in the uh, deed records. Um, the records have the, you know, the address, the, the parties, but it didn't have the form of ownership. So the only way to get at that was to look at the deeds themselves. Um, and fortunately they're uh, scanned back to like 1970 in PDF form, uh, but still for 18,000 properties. So uh, we settled on doing a 1% sample. So I looked at 180, two of them uh, with some help from attorneys to like double check things that were confusing. And we found that 7% uh, were owned as tenants in common. Uh, so we kind of just extrapolated from that to the full 18,000 universe and came up with another uh, 1,300 that were likely tangled. So together that's our um, 10,407. Uh, and then from there, aggregating up to the census tracts, which allowed us to tie it into uh, ACS uh, you know, demographic data. Uh, so just quick on the kind of impact, um, uh, this is my collage I made yesterday, um, but we got some uh, you know, really great press coverage uh, with this. 
um, in the you know in the local paper. There was even uh, on our uh, local news interviewed a, a colleague of mine uh, about the issue. So I think really helped to elevate it. And that 1.1 billion number, uh, a lot of people uh, jumped on. Um, and a lot of credit also goes to uh, you know the advocates in the field, including the, the second uh, one there and the, the Tribune. Uh, that's our you know, charismatic uh, register of wills, who's really made this a centerpiece of uh, her office's work and is all over town and all over YouTube and social media kind of promoting it. And uh, she points to the report a lot. Um, and then uh, another major driver was uh, shown smiling here, council member Catherine Gilmore Richardson, uh, who uh, dealt with tangled title issues in her own family and really championed, championed the issue uh, from city council and uh, invited me, I got to testify to city council about this and uh, you know, like to think that helped that uh, the city passed legislation that allocating $7.6 million in funds over four years, 1.9 million per year, um, over, uh, up from I think about $130,000 a year. So a major escalation um, to uh, help address the issue. Uh, they also passed a law that's the that little piece of paper in the corner that starts August 1st, but funeral homes will have to give out like this three page information sheet to everybody, um, just letting them know what they need to do about uh, probate. Um, and uh, the top right is uh, another kind of information thing that the, the Register of Wills got inserted in uh, water bills. And it also comes up if you pay your water bill online with a link. Um, and that does cite our uh, 10,000 number in there. So we take some credit for that, but uh, just really letting people know because what was crazy for me doing this research, and I didn't know anything about probate before I started, but n nobody does apparently. Uh, it's, it's wild. And like talking to my friends and family, like it, nobody knows how it works or what to do. And yet in Philadelphia, 3,000 properties a year go through probate. And even like, like what happened when like, you know, Nana died and like no one in my family even knows somehow it just happens. So the right information gets to the right people at the right time that, uh, you know, it happens for a lot of people. And then others who have, uh, you know, don't have that information or just don't have the, the trust in, um, uh, you know, in dealing with the uh, city offices, you know, it just, it, it doesn't happen. Um, so I think getting the information out is really uh, important. And then the other piece, this, this middle bit of uh, Philadelphia VIP, which is a legal services organization that connects uh, people in need to pro bono attorneys. Um, and they were a huge resource for you know, me in like learning about this and, and other legal uh, advocates that uh, you know, have used the data to promote their work and to kind of target it uh, geographically. Um, uh, so yeah, I think in like how it worked in making an impact of the, the advocates are really who carried it both inside and outside of government. But, uh, you know, they all point to the number uh, and, and kind of to the report, which is gratifying that like, you know, we've kind of helped them, but uh, our role, we don't really see as real advocate -y, but, uh, you know, to be able to give them the information to uh, make it happen has been, uh, has been nice. So uh, I put some quotes up that are in the report just to do something with this last slide, other than to just say thanks, but um, thank you. Yeah, that's... Uh, And I must have been talking fast because I timed this out and it took longer when I was <laughs> calmer. So sorry. Yeah. So um, I think these are pretty much pretty much. Um, definitely on, right? So maybe if you ask a question, I can either repeat it. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but um, if anybody here in the audience has, I'm sorry. Uh, no, because the camera's on you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I'm, I'm the hidden voice behind the camera. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Any questions we have? Just panic. Uh, Garrett, I noticed that you have a black butterfly problem as well. Coming up Broad Street and going mm -hmm. to the west, uh, you have a Baltimore. And so the causes of your tangled houses are right there coming up from Center City. And that's based upon a lot of things probably. Because I'm from Pennsylvania, I'm from Pittsburgh originally, and the responses of low income persons coming from working in the, um, the mills and the, the areas that were around Philadelphia, 
it, it now gone away. So the persons who are in the houses have no income and therefore they have no understanding of what probate or inheritance is about. Mm -hmm. In your research, did you find the educational issues as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's and this is this quote of uh, Monique Spicer in, in North uh, Philadelphia. But my yeah, my mother passed away. I had the house, uh, but I never put it in my name. I was the only heir. I was thinking it automatically went to me. Fair enough. I would have thought that too, but uh, it's actually not the case. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of it is like just not uh, knowing until you run into a problem or like this Michael Schwartz uh, here, uh, you know, just running into trouble. Yeah, actually everybody. And yes, me putting these quotes here. Uh, uh, you know, having the sewer line break and then you go to get to the repair program and they go, well, you're not on the deed and then you're, you're, you're screwed. So all of these have happy endings. Uh, you know, Gina Miller worked with Philadelphia VIP, was able to get the assistance program. You can kind of get into a lot of them provisionally, but you have three years to sort it out uh, before, um, you know, you have three years to fix your tangle title. Um, but yeah, you need the information and then you need an attorney um, and that's where that money the city allocated really helps because uh, I think a lot of that will help pay for uh, legal services, which is what is, because uh, it's, it's can be really hard, especially if a lot of time has passed to sort out on your own. Um, but uh, Mr. Campbell's other point is that there's a pattern in Philadelphia too. I don't know if you want to show that uh, Philadelphia map again. Yeah. Um, right, a lot of maps yeah. you make of Philadelphia, like that's a very good pattern. look like uh, this. Um, in various ways. So yeah, I know I, I think uh, I took a lot of notes, uh, including Baltimore's black butterfly. Um, but yeah, there's definitely uh, systemic issues and real divergence between uh, neighborhoods, you know, indicators but, and trends, uh, certainly. Oh, so I think he's saying, uh, can you get this table by educational attainment too? Uh, yeah, and I had, I did, yeah, I have all the, all the things, but yeah, they're, uh, they all end up being kind of similar. And there is a microphone. Oh. Or I can repeat the question. Right. If you don't have a will, how do you know? Well, that's why I think the uh, thing with um, funeral uh, homes uh, having to pass on information is, is huge. And that little insert that was in the uh, water bills, which like everybody should get a water bill. Um, but yeah, is your name, is your home in the name of a deceased person uh, to kind of get that out there. But uh, that I don't know. That part is baffling. How anybody yeah, knows that? <laughs> and I think you know that. That's what I think the report, like getting this in the you know the local news, uh, the local AARP did a couple of events around this. Uh, one of which I, I spoke at. So, you know, trying to get directly to the people. I fielded a few uh, calls from people who uh, have called Pew, like asking for help. And I, you know, uh, refer them to the legal services uh, folks, but, um, or even, you know, a close family friend, I found out had this problem. Uh, dad's friend, Peter's sister had a house in Germantown that uh, the parents had died in the seventies and never done. So they're trying to sort that out now. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but a, a lot, I think a lot of it is the information gap and it's it just much easier. You have to go through probate if someone died 20 years ago or if they died two weeks ago. Uh, it's just a lot easier to do if they've died two weeks ago. A um, um, couple of things just to follow up. Tim Chance is here from MVLS and gonna do a mind meld with Garrett over lunch, I think, <laughs> because he's, I think you're literally called the Tangle Title Attorney, right? <laughs> oh. He's the Tangle Title Attorney for Baltimore. Um, uh, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a Tangle Title Fund um, that is administered by Philadelphia VIP. And uh, so this is before this pass, and, but the report has a Tangle Title Fund provides 50 to 100 grants, uh, 1,700 on average, up to 4,000. Um, and, uh, and VIP also connects with um, uh, pro bono attorneys. So a lot of that is the... Uh, yeah, attorney cost. And there is, uh, we have community legal services, there's senior law, there's other, uh, you know, attorneys who will, will take these cases on uh, for free, but probably not at the scale needed. Um, so uh, I, hopefully that's what some of that money's going to, I'm not actually sure. Um, um, just by way of background, also one of the reasons why Garrett is here, because uh, the, uh, we at Binia are working with MVLS to try and understand the, the gap here in the city of Baltimore and get that number. We want to get this number. So we're going to try and uh, follow a very similar um, methodology. So I have some methodological questions, but the other thing that we found so far in our kind of uh, environmental scan of the problem is that it's not like you create a will and you're done because things change in your life. You know, a child is born, um, somebody passes away and is no longer relevant on your will. And so a will is actually a living document, which I guess makes sense, <laughs> but uh, you have to keep changing the will. And so for even the volunteer lawyers, it's not a very quick process to do estate administration because it takes a long time. And for a volunteer lawyer to stay with a, one client for, I think it was years in some cases, um, that's a tough sell. Um, I don't know if that came up in some of your conversations about um, you know, the $9,000, but it's also a long time too. Yeah, I mean, there's like reporting requirements. You have to advertise that should be up for a year for creditors to come forward. And if you like don't have a will and it goes through, the alternative is intestacy law, which is in state law of who it uh, goes to. And it can be all the way to like a children of first cousins or something. Uh, but you have to track all of them down to have them uh, potentially like, uh, you know, renounce their share or buy them out or whatever. So it can get really complicated. And then if one of those has died, then you have the heirs of heirs. So it, it can be, uh, yeah, it can be a lot. Um, and the, yeah, the, the will, Tracy uh, Gordon, you know, had the line of, uh, uh, you know, you, you need a will when you get assets, not when you get old. Um, and uh, uh, her office has done a bunch of like YouTube videos trying to encourage people, but that also uh, that someone needs to know where to find the will. Uh, you know, it's not just enough to make it and then they, they need to, you know, execute it. But one of the things a will does is you name your, uh, who to administer the estate. So hopefully that person is, is ready uh, to, you know, get into action. Um, and, you know, my parents didn't have a will until I was doing this report and I was talking to them about it. Uh, so they, <laughs> they, they made one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's uncomfortable conversation. <laughs> right. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, you know, register kind of like it's like an insurance policy like you have insurance to protect your uh you know your belongings and this is like an insurance policy for your generational wealth um to make sure it you know goes to who you want it to go to um so any tips for us in baltimore which service was the best black box <laughs> uh, or are you not at liberty to disclose <laughs> i thought it was but then we so Philadelphia VIP, uh, again, they did a, along with a group at Penn, did a version of this in 2007, uh, and they used a company called Anchor Computer. Uh, so we went with them again. Um, uh, I think they're all about, when I looked at like $2 per thousand names. Um, so yeah, it, it adds up a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's who we went with, but uh, I don't, and you also mentioned that um, the deceased record is only one reason why it's at liberty to disclose. Um, what are some of the other things that you wish you had tried to contact? Um, I if there was anything. Well, I don't know. So in Pennsylvania, uh, it's different here, but like one of the ways of rent to own agreements, kind of alternative financing scheme for people who you know might not have access to uh, traditional mortgages. And those aren't recorded anywhere. Uh, it's like a private contract. So there's really no way to know when those happen. And, and those are also not a probate thing. That would be a, 
a quiet title lawsuit in in civil court. Uh, um, but I guess that's really, I don't know. I think that's the only one that would have a, uh, a record that is hypothetically knowable, but we don't know it. Uh, I think, um, I don't remember if we had that, or I don't know if, uh, the, the gentleman, Mr. Baltimore Tangle Title Attorney can, uh, the amount of time, time it resolve. takes to resolve. It could be as little as six months to nine years, apparently. <laughs> especially during the pandemic. Recordation has taken a long time. Yeah, we have a year or more. I, well, this is funny too, and I, was, uh, I think it's funny. I, you know, I had to ask a lot of attorneys a question and there was not one question I asked that the answer wasn't, well, it depends. Um, <laughs> well, I gotta, I gotta, Try to put this in 20 pages. So, like, let's, uh, yeah, but it all depends. Uh, My question is around transparency and access to information. You may not know the question, the answer for, for Baltimore, but things like who regulates? I mean, you had a slide there talking about various pieces of lacking information or unclear information or fuzziness about title. Um, in order for you to find that, was that only done by hard copy? Is anything electronic in Philadelphia that you can do an easy search? And the other question is, who regulates how all that is done? Is it through the Register of Wills? Is that a state regulation? Is that a local regulation about how, if one was to be an advocate for improving the, the system? Is it through, can you identify what governmental agency regulates that? Thank you. Office of Property Assessments Records. So you can look up your house and see if your name is on it. Um, the Register of Wills Office uh, oversees the probate process and it is a state created office. Uh, what I think is interesting, and I don't know if it's the same everywhere, the Register of Wills does not register wills. Uh, there's no like, you can't make a will and put it on file to like get activated somewhere. And this isn't just hypothetical, I don't know, if, but. Uh, you know, when someone dies, then you take the will to the Register of Wills office and they verify it and start the process. But like, you can't put that on file in advance, uh, um, which was confusing to me because the, the name of the office implies that that's what they do. I thought, uh, um, but that's not how it works. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what, who uh, oversee. Yeah, I'm not Clear, maybe what the did I answer that? They mean you want to do a research project around and partner with someone mm -hmm. to begin this process to get even access to the kind of information that you have about percentage that you have a will. You can talk uh, promoting generational wealth, being in front of mind of people, but mm -hmm. the gravity of the issue. What are the barriers to getting to that? That's where I'm going. Yeah, who has a will was hard. That was a national stat we found in like one report, and there's a few kind of divergent. Uh, I mean, I yeah, I have no idea. So we have no idea who has a will uh, locally uh, because they're not uh, registered. And the, the only local one was in you know public records, but of of, of who the owner is. Uh, I don't even mean a real will. I mean, you were talking about title, so specifically about titles and tangled titles that are in Baltimore. To do that research here, I'm just wondering what is the similarity? No, it may not be similarity, but the process in which to untangle a title in Baltimore. Um, so my question is around like who regulates basically the title? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a couple of things here, but 
if we were to incorporate that as part of building generational wealth in Baltimore, uh, but I guess we'd have to break down the flow of how how to clean that up and where that information is and who has access to it and how to get to that. So um, what I want to do is invite you to join Garrett and Tim for lunch <laughs> because this is a very deep question. And there's a difference between a will and there's also a difference between um, an estate deed, right? Something where it's not even a part of your will, it's just in the deed itself of where a, a, a property might go. And that's another avenue that you might wanna transfer your property to. I don't know if that's, I'm assuming that's true in Philadelphia too, right? Colloquial name for it of like a South Philly will or something, but yeah, you put a it- A South Philly will. <laughs> But the attorneys discourage Italian section of Philly if you were <laughs> discourage that as a way of. of... But you can uh, detangle um, your property and the way that that gets transferred from all of your other assets, like your money and your jewels and your and whatever is portrait or. <laughs> um, but anyway. I want to thank you so much, Garrett. And I'm so excited that you're going to stay, stick around with us. Um, literally at lunch, we welcome all of you to network with each other. And if uh, Garrett and Tim are sitting at a table, you can pick their brains. We are going to shift gears to our online Zoom speakers. So you have about eight minutes if you want to grab some more coffee and we will be back. Thank you.
like we talked about how if somebody has a um, the sewer line that was broken and they want to get some grant money for that, they're cut out of that kind of financial resource because of Tangle Title. So connectivity is going to be um, all about this and literally about the second topic about digital connectivity. And I want to welcome um, John Horgan, who's a, a good friend of the Beena Project. And he's going to be talking about some access issues. Really, it's not again about the. It's not just about the line. It's not just about the computer or device. It's about affordability as well. Um, so John Horgan is senior fellow at the Benton Institute on Broadband and Society, and focuses on technology adoption and digital inclusion. Uh, John has served as associate director of the research at the Puch Research Center. Oh my God, there's a Pew theme here and senior fellow at the Technology Policy Institute. During the Obama administration, John was part of the leadership team at the Federal Communications Communica uh, Commission for development of the National Broadband Plan. Uh, for NBP, John was responsible for the plan's recommendation and broadband adoption. John has a PhD in public policy from the University of Texas at Austin and is an alma mater at the University of Virginia. All right, John, we're gonna test you out and um, test out your screen share and your voice. I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Welcome. Am I on? We can hear you. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Seema. Thanks everyone for letting me zoom on in. I am gonna talk about the digital divide and digital connectivity in Baltimore. I'm going to try to share my screen and hope that that does mean you can see a slideshow. I hope that's the case. Yep, yep, we're good. Great. Technology is working thanks to our Office of Technology Services. <laughs> well, thanks to them for uh, closing the digital skills gap in, in this instance. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk about something called the Affordable, the affordable Connectivity Plan and how Baltimore is doing with that program. But before I get there, I wanna give a little bit of context. Um, the Affordable Connectivity Plan pertains to broadband adoption for households. Uh, and it's a subsidy program to help broadband become more affordable to households. This was a program passed in the Infrastructure Act um, it's a $14.2 billion plan administered by the Federal Communications Commission to provide a $30 per month subsidy to qualified households for their internet service. The broader context is that this was part of the efforts to address the digital divide, given what the pandemic exposed as substantial gaps in home broadband adoption throughout the country. Initially, when school became Zoom school, a lot of the focus in communities was on addressing uh, the so-called homework gap, meaning um, kids were sent home from school, kids were told to log on to school, and people were shocked to dif discover that um, many uh, lower income households in particular didn't have the online tools at home to engage in school. Um, the digital divide has been around as long as the internet revolution ha has been around, but the pandemic really underscored its scope for policymakers. So the Affordable Connectivity Plan is an effort to address one component of the digital divide. There are basically two parts to the digital divide. One is the topic I'm going to talk about, which is whether service is affordable to households, given that there are networks present to serve their home. So in Baltimore City, for instance, um, network connectivity is fairly ubiquitous, uh, but as many as 40% of households don't have a wireline broadband subscription at home, and that's mostly because those households have difficulty affording service. There are parts of the country, more likely to be rural ones, who suffer from the second component of the digital divide that I'm not going to talk about today. And that second component is network deployment, whether a network or an adequate network exists uh, serving your household to make subscription 
um, either possible or worthwhile. So let's get in a little bit to what the digital, uh, the affordable connectivity plan is. It has two goals to increase broadband adoption, but also ease the cost burden for lower income households. So the increased broadband adoption part uh, tries to close what in Baltimore City is a gap of about 40 percentage points, getting people who um, heretofore have not had service online with this subsidy that should solve the affordability problem. Um, another part of it is, if you look at research, and I've conducted this research, you have many lower income households who have service, but say they find it difficult to afford service. So the um, ACP is designed to help those households who may have already been connected to the internet um, have a little easier time affording service. The slide goes through the eligibility criteria um, listed there, basically, if you're SNAP eligible on Medicaid, uh, really, if your income is 200% or less of the federal poverty guideline, you're eligible for getting the $30 per month subsidy for internet service and a one-time $100 subsidy for device. For the most part, in uptake of the program, uh, people have been taking advantage of the $30 per month subsidy. So the ACP has been around, um, in a sense, for about a year. Um, the Infrastructure Act kind of migrated a prior program into the affordable affordable connectivity plan. Um, during the pandemic, Congress on an emergency basis passed the, you know, what was called the, the emergency broadband benefit, which is a $50 per month subsidy for service. That benefit sunsetted at the end of last year. And at the beginning of this year, it was transitioned to the affordable connectivity plan and the subsidy was changed from $50 per month to $30 per month. Um, how has enrollment gone? Um, this just gives monthly data in number of enrollees in ACP by the millions. Um, yesterday, um, if some of you are highly attuned to news relating to the digital divide, um, Vice President Harris did a, an event where she noted um, something like a million new ACP subscribers um, in the past several months and made the claim that the administration's efforts at outreach boosted ACP enrollment by 35 percent. I actually don't know where that number comes from, but we're going to get into some data about Baltimore that suggests that if you, you know, had to put me in a court of law and, and swear that that 35 percent number is correct. I might have some uh, skepticism about that, but I think it's it's directionally correct in that it might not be as high as 35% boost due to outreach, but certainly outreach does help get people using the affordable connectivity program. So you can see in the past year a steady increase in enrollment from 3 million to where we stand today, about 12 and a half million. Um, what about Baltimore? This is the portion of the presentation where I want to emphasize that that uptake rate from 3 million to 12 and a half million is probably a pretty solid uptake rate for a new program. So there's been that steady increase in enrollment, probably by now um, something like 25% of eligible households nationwide have enrolled for uh, the affordable connectivity plan. But adoption has been unequal. And the question I wanna focus on is what about Baltimore? Um, when you look at lists of um, cities that have lower rates of home broadband adoption nationally, Baltimore tends to be in the lower range on those lists. I noted at the outset, according to 2019 government data, Baltimore had about 59% of households connected with a wireline broadband subscription. I emphasize wireline subscription because 
that is the means of connection that is really the most robust for applications like um, telehealth, um, classes at home, doing work from home. So Baltimore was among uh, the lowest cities in, in the United States, or at least among the lowest larger cities in the United States in broadband adoption with 59%, according to government data from a couple of years ago. It's probably a little bit better today. Um, and in the upper ranges of cities or places like Seattle, who have over 80% of households with a wireline broadband at home. So overall, Baltimore tends to be an underperformer in adoption rates citywide focusing on Baltimore City. But when you focus on the affordable connectivity plan, the news is better. In early days of ACP enrollment, uh, Baltimore was the fifth, fifth fastest city among the top 40 U.S. cities in terms of population when it comes to early program rollout. So when um, the um, ACP's predecessor program, the Emergency Broadband Benefit, rolled out. Um, Baltimore got there pretty fast in terms of enrollment in the early days. Um, that has generally continued. By the end of March 2022, 48% um, of eligible households in Baltimore had enrolled in ACP much higher than the national rate of enrollment for eligible households. And that was the third best enrollment rate among the top 50 US cities by population. So on enrollment, Baltimore has been doing well. There's another way to think about the ACP issue other than just enrollment rate. It's a perfectly good metric to, to focus upon, um, but you can, also look at performance. That is to say whether enrollment exceeds expectations. And that requires a lot of statistical analysis and statistical modeling that basically um, tries to compare what actual enrollment rates are to what a model would predict enrollment, rate, enrollment rates should be given various social and economic uh, characteristics of a particular geography. The nice people at the uh, in the federal government make um, ACP enrollment data available at the five-digit zip code level. So it actually enables you to do a lot of statistical analysis that looks into what explains um, performance of enrollment in different cities. Yes, eligibility is important, but there could be other factors uh, such as outreach, such as the presence of community anchor institutions like public libraries that might explain uh, enrollment rates. And the statistical analysis that I, that I undertook uh, basically picked apart that question to see how performance or how enrollment rates uh, or enrollment levels compare with predicted um, enrollment levels. And the difference between expectations and predictions is what I mean by level of performance. So again, the good news is that Baltimore does do better than expectations generally when it comes to enrollment in the Affordable Connectivity Plan, about 6% better than expectations which is to say when you do the statistical work, um, Baltimore has enrolled about 6% more ACP households um, than the model would predict. So 6% better is 6% better, not, not too bad. Um, the data let me look at a whole lot of other cities and I just listed a few cities with some very good performance uh, metrics. San Antonio, Cleveland, and Los Angeles, which is obviously a very big city, which has had, uh, I know, some uh, outreach campaigns to try to boost uh, enrollment. So um, again, Baltimore is in pretty good standing, and there's a list of, uh, just a short list of cities that are doing pretty well. Just as a parenthetical, interestingly to me at least, is some of the cities who performance, whose performance numbers weren't very good are all these high-tech places. So San Jose, Austin, Seattle, 
Um, they do have fewer eligible households than a lot of other places, but even taking into account um, eligibility uh, levels in those cities, they're not performing very well with respect to ACP uptake. So um, even though Austin, Texas is a very vibrant and uh, wealthy place, it does have poor neighborhoods and uh, lower income neighborhoods in a place like Austin are not doing as well as uh, places like Baltimore. So I mentioned that it's possible to look at this data at the five digit zip code level. So when I did all this data crunching among the first things I did was look at Baltimore. Um, and you can see that there are some specific places where performance is a lot better than expected. The Johnston Square neighborhood, the Broadway East neighborhood, both are doing substantially better than expected. 25% uh, better for Johnston Square, 31% better for Broadway East. I also know from talking to uh, folks around town that there have been a number of community investments in those areas, not just in, um, in ACP outreach, but in other kinds of sort of social capital building undertakings, a lot of them led by Rebuild Baltimore, that may have something to do with that very good performance level. What you can also do with this data is find that, you know, there are areas sometimes with very similar demographic profiles that can have very different performance. And so I just picked um, a good, ex good comparative example that I gleaned from the data for Baltimore um, in the Edner Gardens Lakeside area, that's a place doing 20% better than expected. Um, in Southwest Baltimore in the Irvington area, the 21229 zip code, doing about average. So there's a difference um, in performance in those two neighborhoods that um, community stakeholders might want to look at and try to understand uh, better. I can tell you both neighborhoods have roughly the same number of eligible households. Um, similar demographic uh, profiles in terms of race, race ethnicity as well. Um, so a question for stakeholders and policymakers is what influences performance rates? Um, the first answer is community anchor institutions, public libraries. The statistical analysis indicated that zip codes with public library branches in them uh, receive about a 6% of performance boost. Um, it's a significant, um, if medium in terms of uh, dimension of impact or size of impact, but it, it is the case that um, if you live near a public library, um, holding a whole bunch of other things constant like eligibility rates, household income, demographics, you're a little more likely to have enrolled in the Affordable Connectivity Program. Outreach matters as well. Um, I uh, reached out to people um, in the city of Cleveland and um, Leon Wilson with the um, Cleveland Foundation, who, depending on how much you're into this digital divide policy space, uh, Leon's name might be familiar. But anyway, um, I was aware that there had been some targeted outreach efforts there and they were kind enough to provide some uh, information to me on which zip codes were targeted. And uh, you know, this is a correlation, so it doesn't really lead you to a causal conclusion, but in Cleveland where they did target uh, adds on the availability of the Affordable Connectivity Program and 11 zip codes. Those areas did a lot better than parts of the city where uh, they didn't have those uh, targeted ads. Um, it's also worth knowing that um, for the most part, those areas targeted with ads also had public library branches in them. So Cleveland kind of flooded the zone with some ads partnering with um, the public library as a community anchor institution. And the data suggests that it did make a difference. Um, 
why is this all useful to decision makers? I hope I've um, conveyed that thus far, but it does help identify drivers of performance differences. Um, so socioeconomic factors matter. Um, there is the role of community anchor institutions. I didn't talk about it at great length, but other factors that um, uh, are relevant to rates of ACP adoption are whether um, the household has someone in it who was born in another country. So that suggests that outreach in other languages such as Spanish uh, are likely to make a difference in ACP outreach. And I think it's probably behind how uh, Los Angeles turned up on the list of cities that overperform. Um, this data also invites exploration of the levers that can change performance. Um, outreach campaigns, the role of community anchor institutions. Um, and finally, it's a tool for prioritizing community engagement. Um, in a very real sense, ACP performance is a proxy for a, a city's digital inclusion capacity. And on that point, I'd like to linger a little bit on Baltimore. Um, the field of digital inclusion is a new one. It's probably been a phrase reasonably widely used in telecom policy circles for just half a decade or a little bit more. So it's fairly new. Um, many cities have sort of um, gotten out of the box on that uh, fairly early in the game. Um, cities that I would characterize as having fairly strong digital inclusion uh, efforts at the community level would be um, Philadelphia, Columbus, Ohio, San Antonio, um, and um, Kansas City. Uh, you know, if you were to have asked me that question a couple years ago, I would not at all have put Baltimore on that list. But I think it's a case that since the pandemic, in particular, Baltimore, um, even though it started behind on the digital inclusion curve, has really closed ground rapidly. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Baltimore overperforms on um, ACP enrollment. Um, and then finally, um, this sort of data can help in digital equity planning. Uh, um, the Infrastructure Act um, appropriated um, over $40 billion uh, to close the digital divide. Lots of that goes for network deployment, which makes sense because networks are expensive, but a good chunk does go to digital equity undertakings. In fact, um, the way the US Commerce Department has set up allocating funding for BEAD, and BEAD is the acronym for um, broadband and equitable access, uh, something like that. Um, but in any event, NTIA in allocating BEAD funding puts a lot of premium on states' digital equity planning. And this kind of data can help in the digital equity planning process um, to highlight places that are doing well so that they might be replicated and direct attention and potentially resources to areas uh, falling short. And finally, I do think uh, understanding uh, the digital equity proposition in a state or a city helps complement uh, bead funding, most of which does go for uh, infrastructures and I think helps address uh, what could be a networks to nowhere uh, risk, which is to say you wouldn't want to spend billions of dollars in networks and then not, not have people subscribe to them because they can't afford them. Um, understanding digital equity helps with uh, getting more people subscribing to the networks that some of this, the, the federal dollars uh, will help support. So with that, I will um, conclude. I will see if I can unshare my screen and happy to take questions. Thank you, John. Um, one question that 
that comes immediately, Matt, how do people or local jurisdictions keep track of their ACP uptake? Is there a website or a map or something? There, yeah, um, there's not a map. There is a website, the Universal Service Administrative Company, which is a federal agency that manages this program for the Federal Communications Commission does publish data um, in a big spreadsheet showing ACP enrollment at the five digit zip code level. So you can go there or um, email me if you can't find it because I will tell you that it's not the most user friendly website on the planet. Um, but you can get the data there. And that's where I got the data to do all this analysis. So USAC um, does have in Excel spreadsheets, the data at the five digit zip code level. So for our data science students, it's an excellent data science project <laughs> to create a yes. map of that site. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the audience? Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Gary. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about the digital divide, uh, um, there's a writer, a uh, tech writer, Carl Bode, who always says that when we talk about the digital divide, we always talk about it as if it's something that just randomly happened. Um, when in reality, there's been, um, over decades, there's been, um, it was, it's basically a creation of telecom corporations um, who have, you know, gotten all sorts of federal subsidies and done nothing with it, who will interfere with municipal broadband efforts or efforts to create accurate broadband maps, um, or even just efforts to just create competition. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how sort of um, these things affect uh, cities like Baltimore. Good question. Sure. Um, on the adoption part, what Carl's referring to um, very fairly is the deployment part of the digital divide. And, and he's correct in that decades of subsidies, uh, particularly for rural America has not resulted in um, coverage to a lot of places in rural America so that people can subscribe to broadband. On the adoption side, um, I do think that gaps in broadband adoption have a lot to do with structural, um, economic, and social issues that have been around for years. So if you, I've done this work, if you um, use data that characterizes the degree of a city's um, residential segregation, and we know Baltimore um, has a legacy of residential segregation, um, cities with high levels of residential segregation generally have lower rates of home broadband adoption. And that's a factor that um, is above and beyond the sort of economic issues that you might normally associate with lower rates of broadband adoption. So a lot of those um, structural issues have been built into uh, society for a long time. And, um, you know, I, I do think programs like the ACP helps um, reverse the tide a little bit. Um, but the other part of it is, um, you know, I worked on Capitol Hill years ago. I worked for the Federal Communications Commission. I believe government can be a very constructive force for, for positive change. The existence of the digital divide over a long period of time is not just at the doorstep of the companies that Carl writes about. It's a policy failure um, by the government. Um, inherently um, running either telephone networks or um, broadband networks is not necessarily a monopoly, but it is um, more often than not, um, something that results in a highly concentrated industry. There's just not going to be six really good broadband providers in any given area because 
the capital cost of running networks is so expensive that if six companies tried to do that in a particular area, they would never get enough customers to, to make money. So um, it's inherently a concentrated industry, which can lead to higher prices, which leads to lower broadband adoption. Government has done for years nothing about um, those issues from a pricing level. And uh, that's um, a public policy failure. It's, it's not only uh, about uh, companies taking subsidies and not uh, using them efficiently and effectively, although there's been some of that. So I hope that was an answer to your question. That wasn't too much of a rant. <laughs> Thanks, John. Any other questions from the audience? Coming, coming, coming. I was wondering um, if you think that the, if the federal government were to redraw these uh, census blocks for the for understanding data deployment, would that necessarily have an um, impact on our role in urban areas? Like, will it have a huge impact or is it just like, okay, now we're tracking it, but we still need to increase the deployment of it? Um, to make sure I understand the question, do you mean deployment of networks at the census track network? Yes. Um, and, everywhere. Yes, and accurately counting these individuals in these blocks. I think it would help, but, you know, it's just the start. Um, and, I, you know, I'm a data guy and think we should rely on it for decision making, improve how we collect it. Um, but you then have to act on it. And um, I do think since I believe experience has taught this, that if you just run networks to every neighborhood, um, you're not gonna get universal adoption. You need to do other things in addition to that to make uh, the service more affordable to a lot of households, to help people get competing devices if they don't have them, um, to give them access to the digital skills and tech support that they might need. Um, so, these are kind of wraparound services that need to be, um, you know, funded and supportive, supported in addition to the money that goes to network deployment. So I think understanding uh, the conditions on the ground will help, understanding it better will help, but then you have to uh, take action as well. John, the um, community assets that helped with the adoption is really fascinating. We, we found in our Baltimore Community Change Project that in the places where we had the lowest digital access, we had the greatest increase in people um, getting a public library card, so membership. And the fact that you found that public libraries are a good place for the outreach uh, for the adoption is really interesting. But anecdotally, we also I was just wondering other things that we can track to talk about lack of um, adoption because the zip codes that you said that were showing such variation is really interesting. So anecdotally, you know, getting the broadband into your house is also a physical act, right? You have to actually get the wire into, uh, in case there isn't a wire or if there's an old wire, you have to get a new wire, that kind of thing. Um, I was wondering, anecdotally, we've heard, for example, getting for renters to actually get that wire into the wall sometimes is a barrier because the landlord doesn't want that wall to be opened up because then they might have to do repairs around the opening of the wall or potentially even lead paint remediation, which is a whole different you know, ball of wax. Um, so I was wondering if you have looked at the relationship between adoption and tenure of housing, renter versus owner, um, I don't know if you have access to health, uh, health related information, but um, because the difference between that Ender Gardens and Irvington, um, Irvington does have a lot of vacant and abandoned property in relation to Ender Gardens. So I'm just wondering if the house housing infrastructure itself is causing kind of the adoption to be low. Yeah, definitely. Um, in other work I've done, um, you know, I found that um, the rate of housing vacancies um, is associated with little, lower levels of, of digital access. Um, and in the, the work I did for this ACP analysis, uh, um, I folded in 
uh, whether people, uh, whether households are rent burdened, which is something that the American Community Survey uh, data will provide for you. And that has a negative impact on enrollment in, in ACP. So um, the answer is, yeah, these other um, factors come into play. For apartment units in particular, I think this is where digital navigators can be very helpful. Um, so just like digital inclusion is a fairly new field, the term digital navigator is also a fairly new term, but it's basically a community tech support person. So if you think about it, if you have a problem with your computer, your internet connection, your smartphone, um, in general, who do you turn to that probably does not have a vested interest in the answer that they will give you when you ask the question, which is to say, if you, you know, call up the carrier, they're probably going to try to upgrade your service while they fix your problem or something like that and pick your pocket just a little bit more. Exactly. Digital navigators, which we have in Baltimore City, which I believe are kind of run through the public library, they are in other cities for sure, um, are community members hired to help others address their tech problems and help them figure out, okay, yeah, I have a $30 per month subsidy. That's great. It means I can probably get service for free, um, but I don't have a computer or I have this computer, but I'm not sure it really works very well. What do I do? And a digital navigator can provide those um, services that kind of help for, for those households. Um, and that's part of the story that I didn't quite touch on in Cleveland, but they also have aggressively rolled out digital navigation services in particular areas that I think have made a difference on ECP uptake. Is digital navigators part of the infrastructure bill or is that just something that Cleveland decided to do? Um, in the infrastructure bill, there is, what is it, $2.75 billion over a number of years for digital inclusion programs. So there'll be grants given to states, which in turn will give them to communities for services pertaining to uh, digital inclusion. So that would give localities applying for those funds the opportunity to support digital navigators using those funds. So that's a longish way of saying, yes, in Maryland in the last legislative session, session there was something like $300 million of ARPA funds directed toward the digital divide and some of that um, was directed to digital navigators, although I'm not sure where that sits in terms of money for digital navigators in Maryland actually getting to the ground. But um, there is at least in principle some funding for that in Maryland. Well, we literally have digital navigators in the room making sure our microphones and computers work. <laughs> so we understand the need for, for such great services and hopefully we can get them in our communities. John, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. We have our next speaker, Lisa Cooper, on the line, and we will take a two-minute break just to make sure we can do an audio check with her. Thanks so much, and we'll be back at 11.45.
Does that look okay? Yeah, it looks like you can see it. And how's the audio? Is my audio okay too? Audio is working now. Okay, awesome. All right, do you want me, to, I'll stop sharing for now, right? We are just doing a seventh inning stretch and we'll be right back. <laughs> okay. For our next speaker, Dr. Lisa Cooper, who is, this is very exciting to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa Cooper, MD, PH, MPH, is the James Fries Professor of Medicine at the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor uh, in Public Health and Health and Healthcare at Johns Hopkins University Schools of Medicine, Nursing, and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is the founder and director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity and director of the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute. Dr. Cooper studies how race and socioeconomic factors shape patient care and how health systems and communities can improve the health of populations with complex social needs. She is the author of Why Are Health Disparities Important? Everyone's Problem, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, which was released in June of 2021. Dr. Cooper is the 2007 John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellow, an elected member of the National Economy, uh, Academy of Medicine, 
and a frequent contributor to media outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, NPR, PBS NewsHour. In 2021, in September 2021, Dr. Cooper was appointed by President Joseph Biden to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and I believe that might be where you're calling from. And so we are super grateful to have you join us today to talk about not only uh, you know, Baltimore, but how health disparities are a problem for everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper, for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Seema. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. And um, I guess I'm gonna share my screen and hope everyone can see. So yeah, so it's a pleasure for me to be here to, with you today to share some highlights from my book, Why Our Health Disparities Everyone's Problem. Just making sure I can advance my slides here. Yeah, so this is the cover of the book. Um, and as uh, Seema mentioned, it was published last July by Johns Hopkins University Press as part of a series called the Johns Hopkins Wavelengths. So in this book, what I do is, is explore the root causes of health disparities beyond personal choices and behaviors. And I describe the evolution of my research um, from describing disparities in healthcare and better understanding them uh, to my scholarship on racial differences in communication and to then working in partnership with communities to uh, develop interventions to address these disparities. I also, because I was in the midst of writing the book during the pandemic, got a chance to, dis to include in the book how the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and police violence have re really cast a bright light on racism and health disparities and provided an incredible opportunity for us to address these longstanding issues. So um, this is where I start out. I start out with uh, where it all began for me. Um, as you know, we're all influenced by our experiences and uh, the environments in which we live and, and the opportunities we have. And in my case, these influences were rooted in my childhood in West Africa in a small country called Liberia. I'm descended from uh, a members of a rural West African tribe called the Gola tribe, as well as freed slaves and free blacks who left the United States in the early 1800s uh, and with support from President James Monroe, as well as Francis Scott Key and a number of prominent Marylanders actually, um, who were part of the American Colonization Society. They crossed the Atlantic aboard a ship called the Harriet uh, in 1829 from Norfolk, Virginia, bound for the new colony of Liberia. And so what they were in search of there was freedom uh, and a better life. And so these are my parents in the middle of the slide. Uh, my father was a surgeon. My mother worked as a librarian at the University of Liberia. They were involved in a number of civic organizations and they really provided a lot of support to our extended family. And through their lives and their commitment, my brother and my sister and I really learned about the fact that life was all about how you use your gifts and talents um, to give back to your community and to improve the lives of others. Um, my parents established this uh, small hospital called the Cooper Clinic that's on the, the upper right-hand corner of the slide for diagnosis and special surgery. And that clinic provided uh, services to a broad spectrum of the community. Um, and, you know, when I grew up in Liberia, one of the things I was keenly aware of was how opportunity and privilege shape um, or lack thereof shape a person's future course. So on the one hand, while my family was pretty fortunate in terms of our quality of health, quality of life and our good health, I went to a private school, uh, international school. Um, there were many other children around me who didn't have those same opportunities. Um, most, many people lived in homes with dirt floors, uh, without running water. Many of them didn't have food to eat every day. Uh, many of them didn't have access to health care. And so health disparities were all around me, even though I didn't have words, the words to describe them at that time. So um, a lot of that background shaped my interest and my passion and my desire to, to return really home and uh, to do to improve the lives of people in my home country. 
But I didn't know that I actually would not end up doing that for a long time. And that was really determined by a number of uh, political uh, factors, instability in my home country that led to me uh, leaving Liberia at the age of 17 and coming to the United States. Uh, a, a violence and political instability led to that. So, but fast forward to that time where I came to the US and completed my college education um, and went to medical school at University of North Carolina. I saw health disparities there, but they became even in, into sharper fo focus for me when I moved to Baltimore to do my residency in internal medicine. So as we all know now, but uh, we didn't really have a lot of these definitions uh, back then, is that health disparities are preventable. There are these preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health by socially disadvantaged populations. So in other words, they exist because we sort of, um, we allow them to, you know, um, our systems have uh, created these disparities. Um, but what we, where we really want to be, and we've heard a lot more talk about that recently, is we want to be in a place where there is actually health equity and when every person has the opportunity to attain their best health potential. So, you know, I don't, it's no secret to this group that health disparities are pervasive across conditions, populations, setting. The, these are just a few of the conditions for which we have disparities in health in the United States and actually around the world. Um, whether they be by race or by social class or uh, by some other social uh, determinant uh, circumstance, whether it's like residence or um, in many cases, it, can, it could be a physical or mental uh, disability. Um, people experiencing that disadvantage are marginalized in society from opportunities and then have a higher burden of these diseases. And we recently added to this whole list uh, COVID-19. So, you know, but if we want to address health disparities, and I talk about this in the book, we really have to address the factors. We know how, have to understand how they originate. And I think a lot of people now have come to understand that it's not only about these uh, individual factors that you sort of see in the, in the middle at the bottom. It, it's not just about biology or about the risk behaviors that people engage in but it's really about the opportunities that people have that are based on things like their social relationships, the um, institutions and um, exposures that they have opportunities to, um, to obtain resources from, the physical environments in which they live, the economic policies and social conditions within our country and within our states and our local environments. So you add to that um, the fact that these things don't just come about um, accidentally, that people in different social groups that are shown on the left actually have differences in their exposures to these factors that are shaped by, you know, what we call structural factors now. Things like racism, sexism, classism, and ableism. These are, these are the things that actually shape um, these complex interactions among all these factors and the different levels of exposures that lead to health disparities. And the way that these structural factors do this is that they actually um, initiate prejudices and negative stereotypes that actually lead to less support for uh, egalitarian policies. They lead to, uh, uh, they restrict access to desirable resources, you know, that are delivered by our institutions that include education, employment, housing, and medical care. And then these negative exposures then trigger some damaging psychological responses as well as biological responses. And they also uh, lead to, to you know, more risky behaviors and, and then worse health outcomes. So we know that this is incredibly complex and we've come to understand now over time that it's not about addressing just one or two of these things, but that we actually have to understand a lot of them and how they interact with one another in order to develop solutions to them. But, you know, back when I started out, um, all I knew was that I was seeing patients. I was seeing patients in Baltimore. And by now, many of you have probably seen this map and this slide showing that even in Baltimore, even living five miles apart makes a huge difference in a person's life trajectory. So this is just an example 
comparing Roland Park to Madison East End, showing the 20 year gap in life expectancy between those two neighborhoods, showing the differences in the demographic make, makeup and the income levels, the levels of unemployment in those two neighborhoods, a difference of threefold difference, and then the level of homicide being tenfold greater in Madison East End than it is in Roland Park. So you can see that already based on where somebody is born, um, their future is, is determined largely by these circumstances. So, you know, this was in sharp focus for me when I moved to Baltimore and began my residency uh, training at University of Maryland Hospital. And I talk about this uh, quite a bit in the book. I'm sorry, uh, I'm not sure how that just happened. Here we go. <laughs> I am gonna find the arrow, there we go. So, so here it is. Here is a, um, a photo of the University of Maryland Hospital uh, on the left where I started my residency. And one of the things I noticed when I came to Baltimore was that the patients in Baltimore were actually struggling with things that I had seen among people growing up in Liberia. They were struggling with things like uh, unsafe housing, uh, inadequate access to healthy food, uh, crime, uh, inadequate uh, opportunities for employment, um, discriminatory treatment in different institutions. So these, it really was shocking to me that in the United States of America, with all the amazing resources we have in this country, that there were people living in this country that were experiencing lives not too different from people in a very poor country in Africa. And when, when I noticed that, I thought, you know, that passion that I had for working, going back home to make a difference, that I could actually put that into, into action here, right here uh, in Baltimore. So when I finished my medical training, I went on to Johns Hopkins to, to get more training in public health, um, knowing that in dealing with these problems one patient at a time, that I wasn't making as much progress as I might be able to if I understood much more about how systems operated and how um, broader determinants of health uh, operated in order to produce these negative health outcomes. So I really wanted to learn much more about those things when I came to Johns Hopkins. But what I did was in my early work was that I focused on the fact that, that what I noticed when patients came in for care is that we didn't really recognize their personhood, the uniqueness of them, but that I felt that there were so many differences between the patients that we were seeing and the health professionals that oftentimes we were caught up in all the other problems they were facing and that we, you know, for a variety of reasons, it's not an excuse, but healthcare workers are stressed, overwhelmed, there's inadequate time. And that does, this is a perfect setup for basically uh, making incorrect assumptions about people and, and actually not actually being able to see their humanity. So I really wanted my research to try to unpack more of what is it that people bring into them, bring into the healthcare system when they come in? What kind of beliefs and attitudes that do they have? What kind of prior experiences do they have that influence the way they present to care? And I also wanted to understand more about health professionals and what our backgrounds and experiences, uh, what role they were playing in the, in the care that we were delivering to these patients. Because it didn't seem to me that all patients were getting the same quality of care. I could tell that the more educated and well-to-do patients in Baltimore were definitely getting higher quality of care than those who didn't have those same uh, opportunities. So my early work really described some of those patient attitudes and preferences. And really one of the key uh, findings during some of that early work was a level of mistrust that a lot of uh, the predominantly African-American population of patients that I was uh, caring for had of healthcare for understandable reasons, right? Historical and current experiences of discrimination and uh, lack of access to opportunities. So I set out to uh, better understand what were the, some of the contributors to that mistrust and what role did healthcare play in trying to address some of those issues? What role did the patient physician relationship to begin with, because that's, that was closest to, to me and what I was doing, what role could that play? Because people did highlight that having a good relationship 
with a health professional would definitely change their entire experience and their entire uh, trajectory in terms of what they were able to do to stay healthy. So a lot of my early work focused on the patient physician relationship. And we described um, the fact that a lot of African-American patients, a lot of patients with uh, lower income and less education um, really felt that they didn't get an opportunity to participate in decisions about their treatment. And we actually recorded visits uh, between these patients and their physicians. And we found that doctors were dominating the conversation more. They were engaging in less rapport building and not talking about you know, the broader social uh, issues that a patient might be dealing with. They were just sticking straight to the medical agenda. Um, but what, another thing we noticed was though, if the doctor and the patient shared the same racial or ethnic background, that that kind of shifted, that the visits tended to be a little bit longer, the doctor and the patient sounded more friendly and relaxed, um, and the patients were more involved in decision-making. So needless to say, this was not, not surprising, you know, given that we know that we tend to be more comfortable with people who are like us, but it was a bit disconcerting in, the, in that, you know, as health professionals, we don't go into medicine because we want to treat people of different backgrounds differently. Um, you know, and we uh, ideally would be treating people, of course, you know, fairly and not, um, you know, acting as if this, these were like sort of personal relationships we're having because it's part of our professional code of ethics to do no harm, you know, and to provide the best quality care to everyone we see. So we really didn't think doctors were doing this intentionally. I mean, these were doctors who like agreed to be in this study agreed to be audio recorded with their patients, um, uh, stated like an, an, an explicit desire to work in um, underserved communities. So these weren't, doctors weren't doing this intentionally. So we really wanted to understand more about that. And we went on to study explicit attitudes. And so, as well as implicit attitudes. So we asked doctors explicitly, like how they felt about low income patients, patients with low income and those who identified as African-American, and they had overwhelmingly positive explicit attitudes towards them. But then when we got the doctors to do the IAT, or the implicit association test, we found that two thirds of the doctors actually had an impl implicit preference for whites over blacks. And that was similar to the general population. And then what was more uh, concerning was that the greater the implicit bias score, like the stronger the preference for whites over blacks, the more negative or the poorer the communication quality was with African-American patients. So we had identified that, you know, despite the fact that um, most uh, health professionals are well-meaning, well-intentioned, that there were in fact disparities in the quality of the patient-physician relationship and that there was the role of implicit racial bias in explaining some of the disparities that we that were being increasingly documented in healthcare, and although this wasn't completely shocking, um, I it was something that took uh, it, it gave a lot of people pause. Uh, let's put it this way: I think the broader uh, public health community was more receptive to these ideas than health professionals themselves, who like to think of themselves as being definitely more sort of um, altruistic and humanitarian. And so, as you can imagine, it took a while for this research to be uh, widely uh, accepted. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we persisted in the work uh, and you know, really making the case that if you don't identify a problem and name it, there's no way that you can address it. And, and, and we tried to make the point that, you know, that this was not about people's character or um, what kind of people they were, it was more uh, a, a product of our society and the way we are all socialized. So this work was done in concert with social psychologists, as well as public health researchers, health communications researchers, and clinicians. So, you know, a lot of people got hung up on the, the one study we did where we, I had identified better communication and some better outcomes in race concordant relationships. So they, you know, they thought we were suggesting that everybody needed to be in a race, record, race concordant relationships. Well, we, we know that, that's, that, that there's a clear benefit for that. Um, 
but we also know that universal concordance would not be possible in the United States. Um, so, you know, if you just take a look at this, these data uh, on a national level, you can see that there's overwhelming underrepresentation of African Americans and Hispanics and American Indians in the healthcare um, workforce. So, concordance for everyone is certainly not something that's going to be attainable sometime soon. Um, it's not even necessarily that it should be the goal, but we do know that increasing diversity is an important contributor to, to, uh, to uh, health equity because we know that when there's more diversity among physicians, we know that healthcare tends to improve uh, within an organization. We know that uh, and, uh, there's greater organizational excellence overall. Uh, we also know that physicians from these backgrounds tend to return to the communities from which they come or of which they identify with, which improves access to care. So we know that this is important. And so we did use this work to advocate for the importance of diversification of the healthcare workforce. And so in my book, I do talk about what some of the promising practices are for improving uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity in the healthcare workforce going all the way from programmatic changes in uh, admissions processes, pipeline programs, um, curricular changes uh, within uh, the health professions to uh, uh, leadership training and impli implicit bias training among uh, academic and health system leaders. So that's one area in which um, one could say that that's one potential solution, of course, not the only one to health disparities. Um, what's even pretty probably more important is this idea that, you know, not everyone is going to have a concordant health professional uh, and that or, or interact with people who are concordant with them throughout their life. So that really what we need to be aiming for is something where we improve relationships in general in our society. And that, the, so this really, this work actually led me to sort of a more relationship centered framework to all of uh, my research. So it wasn't only about relationships in healthcare or relationships be between doctors and patients, but it was also about relationships between um, colleagues. It was about the relationship of each person to themselves, how well they understand their own beliefs and values and preferences. And it was about relationships of institutions with their communities. And so I use this metaphor of the, the, the iceberg, uh, the iceberg of culture, um, which really shows that, you know, the different aspects of individuals, organizations, and communities that is that are visible are actually just the tip of the iceberg and that there's so much more that's below the surface that we actually need to understand about, um, about people, about organizations, about communities, if we want to avoid the sort of the danger of running into that iceberg, right? So this is it implies that there's a risk if we don't address the issues beyond the, be below the surface and that working to improve relationships across differences is one really important solution to many of these problems. So um, I had written some work, uh, written up some studies uh, with some colleagues uh, from a variety of different uh, disciplines on this concept of relationship centeredness and its contribution to health equity. And we had identified some core uh, factors that based on the literature and also based on um, you know, theory that we thought would be important uh, to, to address to advance health equity. And they included communication, uh, building respect, mutual respect and trust or trustworthiness, building concordance, not just on visible characteristics, but also on these things that are less visible. So, um, the reality is, is that relationships improve when we find concordance in things like values and um, mental models, for example, or we, we find mutual understanding in those factors so that we don't always have to look for concordance on visible um, or sur surface issues. So that's sort of where it took my, my work went. The next direction was to developing solutions that were relationship centered. And so a couple of the studies that I did early on, and I describe these in more detail in the book, one was called the Triple P study, the patient-physician partnership to improve high blood pressure adherence, 
And what we did in that study was we trained community health workers to serve as coaches to patients attending uh, primary care settings uh, that serve underserved communities. And we trained the physicians in that uh, intensive intervention group to engage in more relationship-centered communication with their patients with hypertension. And we were able to demonstrate that in the most intensive intervention group, and that's the group where the patients got coached and the doctors got trained, that we showed improved communication over a one-year period, and we also showed improved blood pressure control in those patients. And then I did another study called the BRIDGE study, which was focused more on, Af on African Americans with depression. And we, we similarly used some relationship-centered approaches uh, in that project, in, in, in that case using uh, social workers. One arm of the study focused more on sort of the traditional disease model, the other arm of the trial focused more on a relationship-centered model to improving care for depression. And we found that they worked similarly in terms of uh, resolving depression, but that patients uh, reported much better uh, experiences in the relationship-centered program and were more likely to, to attend and be adherent to their appointments in, in that uh, arm of the study. So those were some of my early trials. And that led to the development, uh, an opportunity that came about from NIH in 2010 to establish a center. Uh, and so we were able to establish the center with faculty from schools of medicine, nursing, and public health at Johns Hopkins, focused on promoting in uh, health for socially at risk populations. We celebrated our 10th anniversary in 2020. So we're now uh, going on 12 years. And our mission is to advance scientific knowledge uh, as well as to educate and train leaders and to do all of this in partnership with communities to raise public awareness of health inequities and to promote sustainable changes in practice and policy. So uh, these are members of our community advisory board um, along with a few of our faculty and staff members here in this photo. And I'll just tell you a little bit more about what we've done. So uh, we initially started out with three trials um, focused on uh, improving hypertension control and reducing disparities in Baltimore. One of them was a health system-based program called Project Red Chip. Another one was called Five Plus Nuts and Beans, which focused more on uh, improving the ability of individuals with um, hypertension to access healthy food and to, uh, to make better uh, shopping choices for their food uh, and so that they would be more compliant with a DASH diet uh, as a way of lowering their blood pressure. And then the third project, again, used community health workers uh, to help patients better control their blood pressure by teaching them how to engage in a better self-monitoring uh, at home. And so we showed some really positive results from all three of these trials, but they all identified areas for future um, exploration. So that led us to our next series of studies, uh, and they are shown in the center here, which one of them, the Rich Life Project, we've just completed, which actually combined a commu community health worker uh, outreach program with a health system-based case care management uh, intervention and remote specialist consultation uh, for patients with hypertension throughout Maryland and Pennsylvania. And then we have two other studies that we recently completed, Five Plus Nuts and Beans for kidneys, focused more on patients with kidney disease, um, trying to improve their dietary access uh, by working in partnership with local grocery stores and with the Baltimore Health Department to uh, provide home, um, to provide groceries delivery to the library, public library, so that people living in food deserts could have access to healthy foods. And then um, as you can see here, we have this three-pronged approach where we engage with community health system and policymakers where we do research and then where we also do several uh, types of training where we invite uh, people from across Hopkins, but also from other institutions in Baltimore. And then we even have online courses that um, people can take from around the world. So the, the, the critical piece of all our work is our community-based participatory approach. And so our board has had a 50 to 60 members over the last 12 years. We include, we have community residents, uh, leaders of community-based organizations, 
We have government leaders that are part of our group, uh, faith community leaders, uh, people from educational institutions, um, including um, uh, Morgan State and University of Maryland, business leaders, uh, small business leaders, people from healthcare, of course, and then we have our investigators. And it's really important for us to all bring our perspectives. We use this uh, definitely focus on relationship-centered approaches, mutual respect, um, attention to the needs of, of communities and uh, being responsive uh, to their needs, making sure our research is designed to address the questions that matter most to people, that we incorporate um, their perspective in our approaches, that we build capacity at the same time and learn from one another. So we do um, all of our work uh, in that manner. And so there's a lot of talk about that, about what are some of the lessons learned from some of that work and, and where we still need um, more work. And then I talk also about some of my, my global work, which I've had the opportunity, fortunately, to return to Africa and to get involved in, in work to improve um, uh, access to vaccines, whether it be for Ebola or COVID in West Africa, as well as treatment for hypertension. Um, and this is just like a snapshot of some of the work the center did during the COVID pandemic, where we really engaged uh, a lot with policymakers and government leaders, as well as with communities to identify the needs to get the word out about, to get accurate information out about the virus and about its uh, treatment, uh, about testing, about vaccines, um, and really just to engage with local and national organizations, with the media, in any way we could uh, to support our, our community. So, it, it, you know, we really made, took advantage of something that was a difficult situation and used it, uh, which I think for good and really strengthened our relationships and our impact. And so I'm gonna give you my closing, my take home points, because we may be running out of time. Uh, my take home points in the book are that health inequities harm us all because everyone's health is interconnected. That health equity improves conditions for everyone um, because even though we might be trying to tailor uh, approaches to people who are most in need that most of the time, what we do for those folks ends up helping everyone. Um, and then I talk about the fact that equality is not the same as equity. This is from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. That means that we give uh, to groups and individuals according to need and, and not that we don't use a one size fits all approach. Um, that we do have important uh, research uh, and programs that, that do are effective for health equity that we really just need to implement them and build political will for them. So some of them fall into the bucket of building communities of opportunity, and that's really focusing more on social determinants of health, building more health into the delivery of healthcare, and that's really elevating the role of health systems in being a, a strong partners uh, with other sectors and with community. And then the final one is building broader sort of public awareness and empathy and political will for addressing inequities. Now, lesson five is that addressing these disparities requires all of us leaving our comfort zones to build relationships with others. And I think I already talked a lot about that in my work and that we each have a role to play. That it's not one person or group that can solve this problem, but it's through strong and effective partnerships that we will uh, reach uh, our vision of health equity. And that as we learn from one another and jointly uh, develop solutions, we can produce real changes in organizations and communities and in our nation. And so this is a sort of an African proverb that uh, underlies a lot of the principles in my work. And, and it says, if you wanna go fast, go alone, but if you wanna go far, go together. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, take any questions you all may have.